Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jill Kaplan. I'm the head of development for United World College Southeast Asia. And it is my privilege to welcome you to the UWC SEA Forum, the capstone event in our 50th anniversary year. We're so excited so many of you joined us yesterday for the incredible presentations that we heard. And this morning um, we heard from Faith in a keynote presentation and discussion with some incredibly dynamic um, students. And if you were unable to join us this morning or for any of the sessions yesterday or throughout today, they will all be recorded, including this session, and you can view them after the presentations and the weekend can conclude. Um, it is my honor to welcome you to this morning's session, which is moving towards an inclusive linguistic community at UWC SEA. And I think you're in store for a really fantastic presentation. And I'm sure that lots of conversation will come out of it as well. Um, after we hear from Ellie and Pilar, a few housekeeping items before we start. As you can see, we're in a Zoom meeting, um, not a webinar, and so you'll be able to be seen on camera. So please have your cameras on if you um, are able and if you want to show your faces, which we'd love to see. Um, please pop your questions into the chat. Everyone can see the questions in the chat, and we will try to answer some of them during the course of the presentation. If we're unable to get to all of them, there will be a networking room, which is a virtual opportunity to connect after the session. And I'll tell you more about how to join that um, networking room after the presentation concludes. And um, there will be a couple of polls, so opportunity for interaction. Um, and I think those are all of the housekeeping items I have for you. I will turn it over now to Ellie and Pilar to introduce themselves and get started with today's session. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Jill, um, and welcome everybody to our talk on moving towards an inclusive linguistic community at UWC. My name is Ellie Olchin. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning on the Dover Campus. And my name is Pilar Jimenez. I'm Head of Multilingualism at Dover Campus as well. And we're absolutely delighted to be here with you for the next 50 minutes uh, to take you on our journey. Uh, we're going to tell you a story of our journey towards uh, linguistic inclusion. And uh, we're very, very excited about this journey. In fact, we're quite gushy about it, aren't we, really, <laughs> Pila? But uh, we, uh, we're really looking forward to engaging with you on this, this topic. And we're going to start uh, with a little poll in the chat. So um, I'd like you to just use the chat function to share some of the languages uh, that you speak. OK, don't worry about how proficient you are. We just like to see what you speak. And I'm just going to open the chat so we can see some of the things. Oh, sorry. Okay, I can't actually see the chat <laughs> because I'm logged in. Okay, so I'm wondering, Jill, if you could maybe tell us some of the things that people are saying in the chat because we can't see the chat on our screen right now. Yes, I'm seeing Dutch, English, Chinese, French, Spanish, Arabic. Um, let's see, what else am I seeing? Espanol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's fantastic. Thank you. So uh, like our uh, college, uh, we are a multilingual group here today. And this is what Pilar and I are going to be talking to you about. We're going to start with a very short video uh, just to hear from some of our students, because this is what it's all about, really. It's about our students and their linguistic identities. And uh, so in this very short video, it's just a couple of minutes, but we're going to hear from our students saying what their um, linguistic identities mean to them. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy this. I hope it's not too laggy. And I'm going to play it now. Eu falo português. Eu gosto de falar português porque a minha mamãe também fala. Konnichiwa, Oreo, Oreo. Meu nome é Kyo desu. 
ジャパニーズクロスで好きな授業は、うん、ゲームですそしてそ,そのゲームはジャパニーズゲームベン・アダム、エクスプレイク・ネイドランス、エクドゥ・エッホーム・ランゴス・プロファーマー、オン・ドゥ・エクド・ロー・フィン、オン・マイン・ファーダス。Okay, I'm going to pause it there because we're obviously having some technical issues there. Which is a bit of a shame, but that's okay because we have plenty of other content <laughs> that we're going to be able to talk to you about. So I'm just going to go on to our next、uh, <clears throat> slide、uh, just to share what it is that we're actually going to be talking about with you today.、Um, it's a shame that you couldn't hear all of those uh, uh, lovely comments, but essentially what they were talking about was just how much it means to them being able to、uh, speak their own、uh, mother tongues and develop their own mother tongues. So, what Pilar and I are going to talk to you about today is really two things. The first thing we want to talk about is how important language is、uh, as part of a UWC、uh, SEA education and the journey that we've been on in, in, in kind of understanding that、uh, and how we've been trying to. To move towards、uh, greater linguistic diversity at UWC and what that actually means for us、uh, in, in practice. So, we're going to talk about these、uh, things today. Now, how does this all kind of fit into the big picture? I think、uh, it was really, really interesting hearing、uh, Faith this morning talking about the importance of uh, uh, strategic things and understanding、uh, when you're trying to decide what you should do, what are the most, you know, the high leverage things that, that will have the biggest impact. And so, one of the things we've been thinking about is where does linguistic diversity and inclusion fit in with the bigger picture of our strategy and what we're trying to do at SEA? Now, there are obvious places、uh, where we can see connections. And one of our key kind of strategy points is around making education a force. And we really think that if we want our students to have agents,、uh, agency and to be agents of change, they really need to be able to、um, understand themselves. And I think our students this morning really spoke very powerfully about this the importance of understanding our own cultural identity. And of course, our linguistic identity is very much a part of that identity. So, it's clear that linguistic diversity and inclusion d o e s fit into that bit. But I think if we think a little bit more creatively, we can see how、uh, developing and、uh, appreciating our linguistic identity and, and really creating a sense of belonging around it also fits in with our other parts of our strategy. So,、um, you know, how can we have a, a peaceful and sustainable future?、Uh, how can we be a united community if we don't understand ourselves and understand each other? Uh, and this is a big part of where、uh, linguistic diversity fits. Also, our strength and capacity as an organization, when we look at which students are applying to our college,、um, there's been some really significant shifts in、uh, which students are applying to our college. And so this kind of connects into that work、um, there as well. And Pilar will be talking a little bit more about this when she shares、uh, something of how our profile of our students has changed over time. So, I'm going to move on now to share this wonderful quote from Verna Myers with you,、uh, which makes an interesting、uh, distinction between diversity and inclusion. We talk a lot about diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, at uh, the college. And、uh, Verna says diversity is being invited to the party. Uh, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And I think maybe sometimes、um, we've had a tendency to focus on the diversity piece.、Uh, it's about having as many different you know, people in the, in the building from different places. But actually, if we don't create an environment that is linguistically inclusive,、uh, then people will be、uh, at the party, but they won't necessarily、uh, be being asked to dance. And we want our students to be able to dance as well as just be invited to the party. Uh, so, where does equity fit into this? Well, Verna Myers didn't include that in her quotation,、uh, but what we thought、uh, was that equity is like making sure the party's playlist works for everybody.、Uh, and so that's been a big part of what we've been trying to do. So, <clears throat> I'm going to hand over to Pilar now, who's going to talk about quite an important concept、uh, related to this, which is language attrition.、Mm -hmm. so, so, what happens when the student comes and joins our community and is not able to continue learning his home language? Well,、uh, this, is, um, this is something we need to avoid、uh, because it's, it's called subtractive bilingualism. So, is the learning of another language takes away from the development of the first language. 
and then begins to replace it. This can occur when the individuals begin to assimilate into a dominant culture without continuing to grow or develop their first language. Thank you, Pilar. So we're going to talk about uh, our journey now, because what we're really trying to do is um, prevent language attrition from happening. OK, and uh, we've got the the metaphor of a, of a big colored ball of wool, and we're going to follow uh, the strand of wool uh, to tell uh, a little bit of the narrative of the, the journey that we and East uh, as well uh, have been on uh, in moving towards uh, becoming a more inclusive, um, linguistically inclusive uh, community. So the first kind of step to this really was uh, to talk with uh, some of our language leaders. And we did something called strategic visioning, which was basically we asked them, imagine five years from now, we did this about four years ago, and we said, imagine five years from now, what sorts of things uh, would you want our students um, to be feeling and um, saying and um, you know, doing when it comes towards their uh, linguistic diversity? And some of the things that, um, they said, uh, you can see on this slide. So I'll just give you a minute to just have a, a quick read. Uh, this is what their aspirations were. So it was really pretty inspiring talking to the language teachers because uh, they told us some quite sad stories, really, um, of things that they had experienced. Um, we are an English medium of instruction school, uh, but we are a multilingual school. And yet what they were noticing as language teachers was that for some students, they were embarrassed about their mother tongue. Uh, they were um, speaking to parents who were trying to get their kids to uh, be as good as they possibly could uh, be in English. We had parents who were reading to their children in English, even though their mother tongue was Japanese. Uh, and uh, we had teachers who were perhaps in some cases um, seeing um, being an English language learner as being somehow a bit of a problem. Uh, and actually what we wanted to do was, was move, a sh a really shift towards a, a completely different approach to um, uh, bilingualism, a, a, a more sort of positive approach that really recognised the, the power and the importance of multilingualism. So um, how are we going to do this? Well, one of the first things we needed to do was understand the linguistic profile of our, our, our families. We had some data, but we weren't really sure whether or not the data was accurate. Um, so we did a big language survey uh, for lots and lots of families. And Pila's gonna share a little bit of the results uh, with you now. So what have we learned about the linguistic profiles of our students? Um, Clearly, we found out that we are an English medium of instruction school, but having 58% of our students being bimultilingual, we are indeed a multilingual community. Then we found out 94 different languages are spoken at home by our Dover families. And we also know from admissions that the profile of our students is definitely changing. So um, at Dover, 288 of our families hope their children will be able to study in their home language, which means they develop a cognitive academic language proficiency, which is called CALP, in their home language. 236 families said their priority for their children is to develop basic interpersonal communicative skills, which is called BICS, in their home language, which means to be able to communicate with family and friends. 211 families said their priority is for their children to acquire a foreign language. In the past, what was more important was to develop English, but this survey showed as a new perspective from our multilingual families. So the next step for us was to take this data and to develop a, a language policy. And our language policy was a pretty powerful document. It was co-created um, by language teachers and leaders on both campuses. And it set out our philosophy of language learning, uh, our aspirations, and perhaps most usefully, uh, it helped us establish a, a glossary of terms uh, that we use to talk about language learning. And these are some of the terms that are there. Now it's kind of 
ironic that when we're talking about communication, there's so much jargon when it comes to uh, learning language. Uh, and these are some of the terms that we um, agreed on definitions uh, uh, for, which is quite interesting. Now we've used the term mother tongue, but actually one interesting outcome of this was that we decided we weren't gonna use the term mother tongue anymore. And one of the reasons for that is because of course, fathers talk to their children too. And uh, so the idea of mother tongue is that that it, it suggests that the only way we learn language as, as babies and infants is uh, because our mothers speak to us. But we know that fathers are very important in language learning too. So that's just one example of, of how our thinking changed. Uh, another important uh, shift that we moved uh, away from the idea of talking about students as being EAL students, uh, English as additional language uh, learners, and towards BML, which is bi and multilingual learners. So we talk about our students being BMLs, bi and multilingual learners, because we think that recognizes all the strengths that they bring when they join our community, being able to speak loads and loads of different languages. So, Here's a little test for you. And I'm gonna ask Jill to call out some of the answers because we can't see what you say, but here is a statement. Uh, and we just wanna see whether or not you were listening so far. So this is a little bit of formative assessment for you. Uh, here's a statement. A student with BICS has a higher level of proficiency in a language than a student with CALP. Is that true or is that false? So I'm gonna invite you to put true or false in the chat. I'm gonna ask Jill, if you can just give us a little bit of a, an insight into what people are saying. True, I see a false. Any other perspective? If you're not sure, we're just gonna ask you to guess because then you've <laughs> got- guess. Get in the game. Just yes. one, one true and two falses so far. Remind us what they stand for. A question. A big well, BICS yes. Is, <laughs> this is the, is the question. So BICS is basic interpersonal communicative skills. So I see the language used to communicate uh, with the other speakers, whereas CALP is the cognitive academic language proficiency. So it's the language you use to to do abstract thinking and uh, to process knowledge, obviously in the academic environment. So uh, with those definitions, you can see what the answer is and that actually the answer is false. Uh, and this, the reason we put this here is because this is a very common misconception in our community uh, around language, uh, which is that, you know, you may have a child um, at home and your child is able to converse at the, the dinner table and, and uh, chat about, you know, what happened in their day in their home language. And a lot of people think, well, my child is fluent. Uh, you know, uh, they've developed their language. It's completely fine. They're fluent in Korean. Uh, but of course, what that child is demonstrating uh, at the dinner table conversation is uh, strong BICS skills, but not necessarily strong CALP skills. And given that the uh, aspirations of many uh, of our parents and students are rightly that their children will be able to um, engage with others in their uh, home language at a very high level and, and possibly study in their home language and engage with the literature of their culture and, and so on, have sophisticated conversations as they grow up. Uh, it's very, very important that our children also develop uh, CALP proficiency as well as BICS proficiency. And that's one of the things that um, we really pay attention to at school, how we can uh, support the academic language proficiency of our, our students and not just their basic communica uh, communicative mm -hmm. skills. So it's really, really important uh, understanding this language. And that's why in our language survey, uh, in our language policy, sorry, uh, it was really important that we were clear and that we share with all teachers uh, these important concepts uh, like the difference between Bix and CALP. So the next thing that we did was we realized that we needed to learn uh, a lot more about this area. We have a lot of in-house expertise, but we also are a, an organization that wants to look outwards. And so we hired a, a language consultant, a lady called Yoan Crisfield, uh, who is a real leader in the field. She came and worked with us. She ran um, uh, professional development with our teachers, uh, and it was pretty uh, inspiring. One of the challenges uh, she asked in one of the parent uh, presentations that she did when 
when she was with us, uh, was this really provocative question. And so this is another question where we want to ask you, what is your hunch? What is your gut feeling about who is most responsible for developing a child's home language? So I'm going to ask you to put your responses in uh, the chat. And I'm going to ask Jill once again, thank you, Jill, uh, to uh, share some of your responses with us. I see parents. Parents. Parents and extended family. Parents and extended family. Whole learning community, including families. Mm -hmm. Good. Families are included in the learning. Parents community. and home family, parents in school. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting and what a very enlightened bunch you are, because when Yoin put this question to uh, a, a huge room full of parents, uh, most of the responses were the school, the language teachers, um, the child. Uh, and in fact, what what Yoin was really challenging us to do was to recognize the importance of parents uh, in the development of a child's home language. It's not like maths. As a, as a, as a mom or a dad, uh, you're not responsible for developing your child's, um, you know, maths. numeracy. But uh, when it comes to the home language, uh, you really are the prime uh, person. If you're not supporting your child's home language at home, uh, then uh, language attrition is, is pretty much inevitable. So uh, that's not to say it's all on you. Uh, so one of the things that I think is very, very important for us more than in almost any other aspect of your child's learning, if you're a parent sitting out there uh, listening to this now, is that the relationship with parents is absolutely crucial. Uh, parents as partners when it comes to um, learning home uh, language and developing uh, a child's home language. So uh, that was some learning that we got from the, the consultant. Now, we also um, developed some other sort of areas of our thinking. We recognize that actually language um, learning happens across the curriculum. Uh, a lot of people, another misconception is that um, the people who are responsible for developing language are the language teachers. Uh, and in fact, we now know that in fact, uh, the people responsible for language uh, learning is actually all teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've looked at a lot of ways in which we can support this. Uh, one of the things that we've done is support something called translanguaging professional learning and translanguaging is a really cool thing. Uh, translanguaging is basically where um, you encourage your bi and multilingual learners to use their home and their first um, their dominant language to support their learning in English uh, within the classroom. And one of the ways in which we do that is in primary school, uh, especially with the very earliest learners in K1 and K2, uh, we ensure that students, wherever possible, have a language buddy in the class with them. And again, there are some misconceptions about this. A lot of people think, oh, it's so that they can help them learn English. It's not actually. The reason why if your child is a Hindi speaker, we will make sure there is another Hindi speaker in the class with them is because we want to maintain and develop and support their Hindi language learning. And uh, language buddies is, is one way that we do that. Uh, but a lot of people think that it's just within the primary. And I'm going to show you an example of translanguaging uh, that comes from the high school. So this uh, was an example shared by Dan Orr, who's our head of uh, high school uh, geography. And Dan shared uh, an example of what he did after this uh, translanguage, uh, translanguaging uh, training, uh, that he basically got um, three uh, Chinese speaking grade 12 students in his class uh, who were doing uh, research to um, research their topic using both Chinese and English sources. Two of them presented in English, one of them presented in Chinese. They had English text on the slides because the audience were not all Chinese speakers. Uh, students who did do IB Chinese as a second language were asking uh, questions in Chinese uh, and they replied in both Chinese uh, and English and then at the end they wrapped up with a discussion of the main learning points in English. Now you can see how this sort of approach um, really will deepen the conceptual learning of the Chinese uh, learners in the class, both um, the ones who are learning Chinese as a first language, but also the ones who are taking it as a foreign language. And in fact, we know that all students benefit from learning in multilingual uh, classrooms, even the non Chinese speakers, uh, their understanding of their own linguistic identity is enhanced by being exposed to the linguistic identities of other students in their classes. So translanguaging is something that we're really promoting and using extensively throughout the school now. 
Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was something called linguistic landscaping. And this was something else that you and Chris Field spoke to us about. Uh, it's the idea that we need visible representations of um, the multilingualism in our community uh, to be present uh, on our campuses. And this has happened on both East and Dover. Uh, we've put a lot of effort and time into increasing the exposure, the, the visible signs of different languages on our campus. This is one example uh, from the Dover Primary School. Uh, uh, which is a banner beautifully designed by one of our grade nine students. It is the word for play in lots and lots of different languages. Now there's deep symbolism in her choice of colors and all sorts of things like that. Um, but this was an initiative that was started by our primary school student council who said, we want the word for play in lots of different languages and then taken up by uh, one of the art groups in um, our um, high school. And then this was the result. Another example is our Rainbow Steps, uh, which was another student initiative, uh, a student who's now in grade 12, just graduating, uh, wanted to enhance the steps going up to our uh, library uh, using um, LGBTQ quotes, and uh, we put them in the uh, original language of the people who said them. So not only do our uh, LGBTQ students feel a great sense of belonging and ownership whenever they walk past these steps, but the fact that students can walk up them and see uh, inspiring quotes about inclusion written in Arabic and German and French uh, is really good from a linguistic a landscaping point of view as well. So the key thing here is showing everyone in our community that we value the fact that we are a multilingual community and we may be English medium of instruction but that actually we see our multilingualism as a strength. Okay, so another practical way in which we developed this was through something called language maps. Mm -hmm. And Pilar's going to talk a little bit about uh, what those are. And uh, here's the slide for that. Okay, so we um, the complexity of a multilingual community is, is quite big. And not everybody who is not an expert in languages understands what is what are the different options. Um, so it was very important to establish these language maps and make them available to the rest of the community. Um, so we, we uh, Eliana, we designed this, including um, the first languages, the um, foreign languages, the home languages, and um, we we created a few. We we ran a few workshops with the heads of grade as well, so that they could better advise the families of the different language pathways available in our school. And this is a very important aspect of, um, of the education of a child in our school, to know what is going to be the language pathway across the, the education. Yes, and after that, um, I am going to discuss a little bit, mention a little bit about the expansion of the Home Languages Programme. Um, so uh, the Home Languages Programme uh, is uh, a programme that was designed, uh, started in 2017. And uh, it was an after, it is an after school programme for students who want to maintain a language spoken at home, but do not study this language as part of their academic curriculum. The most important aspects of our home languages program are that lessons are personalized um, to address the wide range of language needs of the students. Classes have to be very small to be able to do this successfully. Teachers follow a responsive approach uh, to design the curriculum rather than a prescriptive curriculum. Um, the home languages program has a very inclusive approach uh, so even heritage language learners, um, so these, these are the students who want to learn uh, the language of a parent, a grandparent or an ancestor, but um, they don't speak the language, unfortunately. So even these students are welcome to join our home languages program. So the, the inclusion is, is based on their relationship with the language rather than with the linguistic level. Um, so um, normally, what, what I want to clarify is that we don't place um, uh, heritage language learners together with home language learners. And in 2017, we started the program uh, with three languages, but in 2022, now we have 15 languages. And then 
from nine teachers, we, we became a, a department of 28 teachers. And from 45 students, we now have 280 students enrolled in our program. And um, this uh, graphic shows that um, there is a great demand of home languages among primary school students, as you can see. Um, perhaps because Chinese is the only, for, uh, the only first language uh, we offer in the curriculum, in addition to English. Um, so having the home languages program is, a crucial, is crucial at this stage of the, of the student's language development. Students need as much support, uh, support as possible to keep the bi-multilingual uh, multilingual learner profile. So as you can see in the graph that uh, from grade six, seven onwards, there are more first languages available in the curriculum. And that's why the students typically exit the home languages program and join the first languages curriculum program. And um, our home languages program is, is tries, uh, well, includes a cultural approach in the language development. So students enjoy numerous opportunities to explore and reflect upon their cultural identities. We try to, to have a wide variety of um, uh, uh, perspective, not just the linguistic, Although, um, uh, obviously, the students consolidate the literacy skills. Thanks, Pilar. So, Pilar was talking about the difference between languages that we can offer in the curriculum and outside of the curriculum. And one of the reasons why um, fewer students do the home languages program in nine and 10 is because we offer a first language course. Now, on Dover, we're very, very excited about our first language course. Um, it is uh, basically a, uh, a program uh, we used to in the past uh, offer IGCSE first language, but then Cambridge decided to um, mm. uh, not offer that anymore. And at first we thought, oh no, and then we thought, oh, great, because what it meant was we could write our own course. And what we've done, and, and I think uh, Faith would be very pleased with us, and so would Masimbi, uh, because actually our course is really all about developing mission competency. So we've written units uh, around sustainability and around peace and around linguistic identity. And um, we basically, uh, this was written by all the first language teachers, uh, and then it is offered in different first languages. So we have... Uh, it's offered in Dutch, in German, in French, in Korean Japanese. Uh, and Japanese. And uh, it's, it's a chance for students to explore the UWC values and mission, but from the perspective of their own linguistic identity. Uh, so it's incredibly exciting. And um, yeah, we're really, really <laughs> proud of that course. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this won't mean anything to you unless you speak uh, German, <laughs> in fact. Uh, but what this shows is that it's the same uh, course, uh, but uh, Wolfgang wrote this uh, this kind of blurb, and this is just part of a much bigger document, so that German families can see uh, what this course means for their uh, for their children. So, <clears throat> moving on. Um, another thing that Joan Crisfield um, uh, stressed to us was the importance of leadership. And uh, in fact, Faith talked about the importance of leadership too. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted to say that one of our uh, biggest uh, achievements was really to secure the role of a head of multilingualism, which is uh, what Pilar is next to me. She's very humble about it, but actually it's fantastic to have someone leading multilingualism. And I've had people writing to me asking about the role and can they see the job description because they want to start having heads of multilingualism in their own schools, which is really, really exciting. Um, so there are other kind of parts of our community where this is really important. And I'd like to talk a little bit about families now. So one of the things that we did in our language survey was we asked families uh, about their um, linguistic needs. So we know that we have a lot of uh, parents in our community for whom English is not their first language. And in some cases, um, they find it quite difficult to access information from the school. So one of the things we wanted to do was set up a system, uh, which we have now done, uh, to make it easier for us to arrange translators uh, and interpreters and to translate a lot of our key communications um, 
into different languages for people. Uh, so some examples of things uh, that, that, that we do for this, and in fact, I'm gonna slip onto the next slide here because I think this is uh, perhaps more helpful, is uh, we have, for example, open days now that are um, in specific languages. Uh, so we have, for example, an open day that was run for our Japanese families and um, just in Japanese. Uh, we have um, translators that now come to our parents' evenings so that um, if, uh, you know, a Chinese family, for example, who uh, needs some support with understanding what's being said about their child can have a translator and so on. Um, so there are some nice little examples here. Uh, we've got intercultural competence workshops for Korean families and so on. These are all coming from our e-brief. And this uh, clip uh, was um, uh, a clip from our Japanese uh, presentation for, for uh, open. It was a virtual open day because it was during the pandemic. And our absolutely amazing Japanese teacher, Reiko, uh, who is in the corner there, uh, translating the whole thing live. And it was incredibly well received by our Japanese community. Uh, and what was interesting here was the numbers. Uh, so normally at our open days, you know, we have a small smattering of, of Japanese families who attend those, even though the Japanese community are very interested in our education. Uh, when we offered it in Japanese, uh, the numbers saw to, you know hundreds and hundreds of families uh, attending which just shows that we were really meeting a demand uh, that we perhaps hadn't been meeting in the past mm -hmm. so that was another thing that we were doing uh, sharing our progress uh, with the community, telling our stories, as Faith talks about it, uh, was a very big part of this journey. And we're very, very grateful to people like Kate Woodford, for example, uh, in uh, comms, who's really supported us uh, with doing this. Uh, we have lots of examples of um, articles, for example, uh, on their website and uh, stories in Dunia, uh, articles uh, that really tell um, and share with our community what our, um, why we've been on the journey that, that, that we have uh, been on, not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. Another significant landmark was the adoption of the CEFA proficiency scale. Now, uh, for those of you who are language uh, linked, you'll know what this is, but it's the Common European Framework, and it's a way of um, uh, describing um, proficiency levels. Now, it was originally developed for European languages, uh, but we also use it um, for um, uh, Asian languages. We work with our Asian language departments to explore what that would look like. And by adopting one common proficiency scale it meant that we as a community could um, talk to each other about uh, the level of, of students um, uh, proficiency um, and some of the things that, that we've, we've done with that, well, this is a little graphic that just shows you. Uh, so when we do the language surveys, we ask parents for input, but we also ask the language teachers to um, talk about what levels are their students are at so that we can track progress uh, and um, understand you know, how, how we're doing and how students are doing. Um, so a big part of this uh, was uh, doing a, a big survey using a, a tool called Track Test, which tested and um, uh, measured English language proficiency uh, and understanding what the CEFA scales were for our students in terms of their English language proficiency so that we can track that and support that. Uh, and that's been very powerful. We've done that uh, on Dover with all our grade sevens, our grade nines and our grade elevens. And we now have much richer data uh, about the linguistic profiles of our students students. Uh, how do we uh, communicate that information? Well, we developed on our uh, common kind of information system for students something called the, the linguistic profile tab or the language tab, as we call it. Uh, and what that means, it's still sort of in the trial phase. But what it means is that when you click on um, your child or on a student uh, on their linguistic profile, uh, you will eventually, uh, as we're populating it with data now, you will eventually get all this rich data about a child's linguistic profile profile. So you can see that for this uh, child um, who uh, happens to be an Australian Japanese student, uh, we can see the information and the uh, CEFA scale for this child's um, three languages, English, uh, which is their dominant language, Japanese, which is their uh, uh, home language, their second language, and uh, Mandarin, which they're taking as a foreign language. And um, the track test, for example, provides us with radar charts. That's this little graphic on the side here uh, that tells us um, uh, where their strengths are. Uh, and areas for growth are and this information you know there's lots of additional information to support teachers in all understanding that they're responsible for developing the the linguistic profile um 
of, of the, the student. And in fact, our aspiration for all of our students is that they will become bilingual. Uh, and um, uh, I think, again, that's another misconception. A lot of people think that um, it's just about maintaining, uh, you know, those children who are lucky enough to be uh, born speaking a language other than English. Uh, they, they're the ones that get to be bilingual. Uh, but in fact, all of our students, um, uh, when they learn a foreign language, we're also moving towards bilingualism uh, for them as well. Okay, so uh, moving uh, sort of on with this, uh, we did mention that uh, our language survey showed that the profile of students who are applying to the college is changing. One of the most significant changes is that we have increasing numbers of English as an additional language learners um, who are applying to come to our college. And so a big part of the more recent work has been reviewing uh, what that process looks like for those students uh, so that they um, feel valued and welcomed in our community and um, uh, some big changes are afoot there which is very exciting. Uh, to support our teachers, uh, we mentioned the translanguaging PL, uh, more recent um, professional development that we've been doing is lots and lots of teachers um, from K to 12 have been doing a major course called um, uh, Bi and Multilingual Learners from the Inside Out, which is an online course involving shared discussion. Uh, and again, very, very exciting work that's really leading to changes in how people are um, teaching in the classroom and, and, and feeling much more uh, positive and asset based in terms of how they approach uh, the needs of their students in their classes. So really, really exciting um, uh, work and uh, uh, including, of course, more parent workshops, which are, are being scheduled both online and now, thankfully, with the new rules, yes. uh, hopefully face to face. Yes. So I'm going to hand over for the final little bit um, to Pilar, who is going to talk a little bit about um, just very briefly about why we're doing this. And I've invited Pilar to speak in her first language, uh, which is uh, Spanish. And I'm going to do uh, probably a, a fairly botchy job of trying to uh, translate as we go so Pilar you're going to go paragraph by paragraph I'm I am going to translate go. <laughs> as you go so we'll just finish off with this and then if you can maybe have your questions at the ready we will have time for some questions at the end thank you Ellie so um, I'm going to speak in Spanish um, cuando um, el colegio del mundo unido del sudeste asiático optó por cambiar su modelo lingüístico y ofrecer una educación más multilingüe y, por lo tanto, más inclusiva, tenía como propósito ofrecer a los estudiantes multilingües oportunidades similares a las de la mayoría lingüística angloparlante. Yeah, so uh, what Pilar just said was that when we were trying to move uh, from our uh, linguistic model to a new linguistic model uh, and to become more multilingual and therefore more inclusive, uh, we were really trying to provide our multilingual students with similar opportunities to the ones that the English speaking majority uh, were getting. Muy bien. <laughs> so um, nuestra decisión no obedeció a intereses económicos, políticos o de marketing. Éramos conscientes de que en las últimas décadas muchos colegios internacionales de prestigio eh, se estaban decantando por modelos educativos bilingües que ofrecían un aprendizaje inmersivo en las lenguas más demandadas, tales como el chino y el inglés. Yeah, so this is really pretty powerful. This is really about the why uh, that we're doing this. And a lot of parents, it's interesting, they come and they say, why can't we have a, um, a more sort of inclusive um, uh, bilingual program that's sort of immersive Chinese and English? And um, uh, what Pilar was just saying there was clarifying that the reason why we did this was not really due to um, marketing or, or economic or political reasons. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, everybody needs to be able to speak Chinese, look at the world today. And uh, it wasn't because we wanted to compete against other international schools that were offering uh, immersive bilingual programs. Uh, we're aware that in recent decades, many prestigious uh, international schools are opting for these models, uh, which offer immersive learning in popular languages such as uh, Chinese and, and English. But there's a reason why we don't do that here. Sin embargo, en nuestro caso, la misión del Colegio del Mundo Unido fue la que realmente determinó el nuevo modelo lingüístico. Si queremos una educación que trabaje por la unión de naciones, pueblos y culturas, es fundamental que los estudiantes no tengan que renunciar a su propia identidad cultural ni lingüística. 
Así pues, el Colegio del Mundo Unido del Sudeste Asiático se decanta por una educación instruida en inglés como lengua vehicular en la que los estudiantes puedan mantener y desarrollar su identidad lingüística en la, en la medida de lo posible. Yeah, so uh, in our case, uh, it was actually our mission that was the reason why we wanted to have a new linguistic model. If we want an education that works to unite nations, peoples and cultures, uh, it's essential that students don't give up their own cultural or linguistic identity. Uh, unlike many other schools that have a bilingual program, uh, we have 94 different mm. languages spoken at UWC. So if we only went for a bilingual program, that wouldn't meet the needs of huge numbers of our students. Mm -hmm. And we don't want our students to give up their cultural and linguistic identity. So for this reason, uh, we have an education education uh, that is instructed or is provided in English, uh, in, but also one that enables them to maintain and develop their linguistic identity as far as possible. Así para terminar, para unir a naciones, pueblos y culturas, es fundamental que nuestra comunidad eh, sea lingüísticamente inclusiva. Yeah, thank you. So she said to sum up. <laughs> Uh, to unite nations, peoples, and cultures, it's essential that our community is linguistically inclusive. Muy bien. So, thank you. <laughs> thank Gracias. you. Gracias. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now, uh, and I'm hoping that you're all still there. <laughs> We haven't been able to see the screen. Okay, so I can see lots of faces. So please do feel free to switch on your screens so we don't just see lots of little uh, names. And uh, we're very happy to take some uh, questions now. Um, I'm just wondering, Jill, if you've got them in the chat, we can now see the chat, which is good. I do. You can see the chat. Um, so there's a question from Florian who's asking, who are the teachers for these courses, which I'm assuming you mean for the home language program, and how can you afford to pay them all? And then um, the second part of that question is whether the home language program is um, supporting home language, uh, is connected in any way with our self-taught courses in the DP. So can you say that again, Jill? The so, last one. Uh, is how is it is it connected? How is HLP connected to self taught? How is HLP connected to self taught? So <laughs> self taught is offered in the IB diploma um, for for those students uh, who want to do language A, uh, the, that is language uh, literature and language and literature. So um, the home languages program is for the students who are not at the IB level yet and they are not able to take, to learn their or develop their first language in their curriculum. That's why this is offered after school. And regarding the teachers, so the teachers are, um, although I, I shouldn't say native speakers because now that terminology is no longer um, uh, acceptable or popular in Singapore, but of course that they speak that language um, proficient, at the proficient level. And um, so they are teachers And um, so we, we recruit them and it's actually that's very, very challenging because it's not always possible. But uh, we have been kind of blessed so far, despite the challenges of the, um, the Singapore uh, changes towards um, recruitment of uh, foreigners, but we are still okay. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why a lot of people want to work um, at the Dover and East campuses in our home languages programs, it's because um, they get a lot of professional uh, support, professional development and growth, and they get to be part of really quite an exciting program. So I would just add to that, which uh, the way I see home languages, it's the home languages program is a way of kind of bridging um, uh, students learning of their home language uh, from, you know, within the family, uh, supporting the development of um, BIC and CALP uh, language proficiency uh, and then hopefully they come into our um, first language courses um, either the self-taught in 910 uh, or the um, first language course that I mentioned uh, and then in those classes uh, we really help to um, prepare them Uh, for taking their first language at, at the IB level. And of course, we do self-taught when we don't have a big enough cohort of a language um, mm. to you know, justify a whole class. Um, the IB also recognizes the value of maintaining a uh, first language. language. And so it's developed a structure that allows that um, uh, you know, to work. Mm -hmm. So thank mm. you. Thank you both. And thank you for the question. The next question comes from James and He's asking, what tool do you use to evaluate proficiency in so many different languages? 
Oh. <laughs> we use, I, well, I think it's fair to say we use teacher expertise. I think mm -hmm. it is a holistic judgment, yes. uh, very mm -hmm. much so. We do have, I mean, obviously there are, you know, um, tests that you can use. And I mentioned uh, track test as being, you know, one tool that we can use to begin to assess uh, language proficiency uh, for English, for example. And we have similar uh, tools for the other languages. But really, we trust, we trust our language teachers. Uh, and of course, Proficiency, there's proficiency in different aspects. So they can be proficient in, in writing or in listening, but less so perhaps in talking or, you know, whatever, and speaking, in speaking uh, and so on. So we recognize that there are different aspects of language learning uh, and different contexts in which students will feel, um, you know, proficient. So they may be very proficient when it comes to BICs, uh, communicating, you know, with their friends and so on. They may be less proficient when it comes to um, the CALP uh, proficiency and so on. So, um, yeah. But we trust our teachers. We, we, we hire amazing master teachers and then we listen to them. Thank you so much. The next question is from Catherine and she's asking whether the journey was similar across the campuses or did it look different on East than it did on Dover or than it has on Dover? Shall I, yeah. shall I explain? <laughs> yeah, so ahead. I think we, we have a lovely analogy that me and the Director of Teaching and Learning on the East Campus, Carla Marshall, we use quite a lot, which is uh, if you imagine a, a like a cycling race uh, where you have people racing in teams and at certain times, uh, different cyclists will go ahead and others will be in the slipstream uh, and then they'll take it in turns and, and, and other times they will, will swap ahead. So I think there are lots of uh, uh, examples uh, from the Dover campus where uh, I think we've uh, been ahead. So we, um, uh, we re you know, hired Yoan Chrisfield, we brought her out. Uh, loads of the teachers from East came and joined uh, the team. I think um, in terms of the community language program at East is, is, is way ahead of us. Uh, they are doing amazing things in the community with increasing access to foreign languages uh, for their community. Um, they broadening the range of different languages that students can teach speak in, in taking primary school so the, the wonderful thing is we're a team and um so there will be similar things but we will be slip streaming uh and learning from each other all all the way through so there are lots of examples of things that are, are, are happening the language policy is very much common uh to the two um uh, campuses um the leadership on the east campus uh in this realm has been um in place they've had people in leadership roles on this for long much longer than we have on Dover. So um, yeah, I would say it's it's very much it's a case of, of moving in the same direction. Uh, sometimes we're ahead, sometimes East is ahead. Excellent. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, what percentage of your students, this is from Alexandra Gimelo, and um, what percentage of your students are choosing a bilingual IB on each campus? How has it evolved since 2017? She says, thank, many thanks for sharing your great journey. <laughs> Oh, I feel like I should have the numbers on my uh, to, to hand. I know it does go up and down in different years. I think, uh, do you know the numbers off the top of your head? I'm not, not by heart. No, 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 no. I don't know the numbers. So to get a bilingual diploma, you have to be taking language A uh, for English and your home language uh, or your first language. But uh, and lots of our students do do that. Um, interestingly, we have quite a lot of uh, our national committee scholars when they come here. And we're all hoping that they will go for bilingual diplomas and develop their um, their, their first language. And in, in many cases, what they want to do is they're wanting to stretch themselves as much as they possibly can. And they're wanting to develop um, a new language as well, which means that they leave us trilingual, but they don't necessarily have a bilingual diploma. So <clears throat> uh, it, it is an interesting metric. Uh, and I would say I would quite like it statistically if we had more students with bilingual diplomas. Uh, we don't have perhaps as many as some of the other UWCs, but that's often because our students are wanting to take uh, new languages as ab initio uh, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, um, currently, um, I think there is a trend that is in, uh, students are feeling more encouraged and confident to go ahead with the bilingual diploma. Um, so. Uh, in the, uh, we are also discussing ways to encourage students to do the extended essay in their in their first language. Yes, um, and also uh, we're TOK. exploring uh, having TOK and offering TOK being taught in different languages, mm -hmm. um, which also is another way 
that uh, you can. Oh, oh, there sorry. you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> our, uh, our, our wonderful boss has just walked in and given us the numbers, <laughs> but I'm looking at it now. Can you see what the numbers are? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this, these, these, the IB. Okay. Wait, wait. We're looking. It's obviously on here. Otherwise, Lizzie, bilingual. Oh, here we are. 20, so yes. Yeah, so it's uh, worldwide. It's about twenty six percent, and at UWC, it's about twenty three percent. So we're just slightly below the worldwide average mm -hmm. uh, for that. Um, but expecting that to increase uh, as we um, offer things like so. If you do TOK in uh, your first language, that also mm. will secure you um, a bilingual diploma as well. Yeah. So a total of 129 students were awarded a bilingual diploma last year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you both. And power of technology that someone sees you and can bring you an answer so quickly. <laughs> Okay, let's hang on. One last question, which I think is, is interesting from Isabel. Some students have a difficult time actually determining their home linguistic identity. Do you have, do you provide any support or opportunity for students to explore? Mm -hmm. I think uh, um, I, I have lots of discussions with the, our bi multilingual families. And um, in those discussions, I always ask the parents, um, okay, so at home, which is the language you use when you are discussing everyday matters. And, and um, sometimes the parents come thinking, uh, this is the dominant language of my child. And throughout the discussion, they see new perspectives. And um, so it's very interesting. There isn't actually, because like what I said, there isn't a, a language assessment to decide what is the linguistic profile of a child? It's also, you, we need to inc include the parents in the discussion and as well as the teachers and, and the child and the student in himself. Yeah, and I, I think that idea of including the student in that conversation is, is fundamental. So one of the things we, we do is we celebrate something called Mother Tongue Day and we, it's called Mother Tongue because it's an international movement. Um, and uh, one of the activities that we did last year was we asked students to write about and reflect upon mm. and write about and share their own stories of their linguistic identities. And there were some really incredibly moving um, anecdotes. Uh, for example, one particular student, I remember reading one article about a student who talked about Hindi and what um, being a Hindi speaker means for her and how um, she, she really felt that, um, uh, you know, not being able to communicate effectively with her grandparents was a deep source of sadness for her. And so she made a sort of personal pledge to develop her Hindi and she was joining the home languages or she had joined the home languages program in order to develop her, her Hindi. And she was reflecting on how um, enriched she felt because she was learning Hindi. Um, so I would say I agree um, that it is very difficult to say, well, you know, this is my lang linguistic identity. It is a dynamic thing. It changes. Uh, and inviting our students to be part of um, uh, that conversation with us is, is really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think um, we'll close and leave that conversation there. I want to close by thanking you, Ellie. Muchísimas gracias a Pilar por esa conversación tan dinámica e interesante. Um, and um, I want to thank all of you for joining the conversation as well from wherever you are. We're so grateful to have um, all of you at, throughout the conference. And um, I think your questions really enriched this discussion. And we look forward to continuing the conversation after this. If you'd like to join the networking room um, that's affiliated with this session, after the session closes, you can go into your app and there's going to be a place um, within this session, Linguistic Diversity, where you can go and click on um, the button to join the networking conversation. I will say that the admission is a bit limited. Um, so if you don't get in immediately, perhaps folks will go in and out of that room um, to continue the conversation there. But I think the ball of wool was a really great analogy. We learned a lot about so many of the different things that are going on at UWC and I think SEA. And I think it's um, fair to say that we really value linguistic diversity at UWC SEA. And it's really critical to all of the facets of our mission to make education a force to unite people, nations, and cultures to create a peaceful and sustainable future. So um, I thank you all for joining us. Please stay with us throughout the afternoon. There are three keynote um, sessions later today. Um, we're going to be hearing um, from Forrest Lee on the future of work. And um, we're going to be hearing from our friends uh, at Amala about the amazing work that they do with education with refugees um, around the world. And um, we'll be closing with a session from Kishore Mabubani on peace. Um, so we hope that you will stay with us. Thank you so much for joining us. 
and enjoy the rest of the forum. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.